All right, here we are in chapter six. Um, Myrtle and Violet just made it to Washington, D.C. with the help of Hobie, the hobo, who used all of his skills um, to get them there. And they had just had the terrifying experience of Myrtle almost being thrown from the train when the brake man decided to try and get money from them. Um, chapter six is called, It All Comes Down to Tennessee. Um, I want you to notice in this chapter, the social, or the, um, what am I trying to say? The clues that we're getting about history of our country and the women's rights to vote, okay? So we're keeping the fiction story alive, of course, about Violet and Myrtle, but also thinking about the real facts that are embedded in this chapter. Violet could see the high needle of the Washington Monument in the distance as they picked their way across the gravel bed of the rail yard and stepped over rails and railroad ties. The smell of coal smoke and axle grease hung over everything. Rows of empty boxcars loomed on every side, and Violet could see smoke rising from a clump of trees where there must be a hobo jungle. It wasn't how Violet had imagined Washington would look. The important thing, though, was whether she would be able to find Chloe here. Violet was glad Myrtle was from Washington. She would know her way around. Remember, they don't have an address for Chloe. Do you know where to find the suffragists, Violet asked Myrtle. Before we find every, anything, we better get cleaned up, Myrtle said, or anybody we find is going to scream for the cops. Myrtle led Violet out of the rail yard and down a cobblestone street with automobiles parked on it here and there. They turned down an alley and then down another alley that led off it. The alley was only just wide enough for a wagon to pass through. Brick and wooden houses lined both sides of it. The houses looked as if someone had built them in a great hurry 50 years ago and then fled. Probably to escape the fury of the people who had to live in them, Violet thought. The houses had no windows that Violet could see. To make up for this lack, there were a few holes where chunks of wall had fallen off. Heaps of uncollected garbage overflowed from garbage cans and filled the corners. And the reek of rotten vegetables and mold mixed with a stench of raw sewage. A well-fed looking rat ambled out of a pile of trash, looked at the girls thoughtfully and waited for them to pass by. This isn't really how I imagined Washington, Violet admitted. Myrtle smiled thinly. No, they don't show this in the picture postcards. Colored children lurked here and there in the alley, but they neither looked at nor spoke to Myrtle or Violet. This is where I used to live, Myrtle said. It's called Louse Home Alley. And if you know what a louse is, that's the type of bug when you hear about people having lice, lice is the plural, louse is the singular. Louse home alley, Violet said, not sure she had heard right. Louse home alley, Myrtle repeated firmly. Here's where we used to wash up. Myrtle led the way down a narrow passage off the alley, which ended in a dirt paved courtyard where a single water faucet came up from a pipe in the ground. There was a toilet of sorts, a shed that housed a long wooden box with holes cut in it. A horrible smell emanated from the deep pit beneath. Violet tried to pretend that this was nothing unusual to her, since her disgust was so clearly amusing to, Vir to Myrtle. Violet liked Myrtle, but wouldn't have minded if she were a little less of a know-it-all. They ducked their heads under the faucet and scrubbed. Violet watched charcoal-colored water run down from Myrtle's hair and face, and she was sure it did from hers, too. Myrtle took off her apron, revealing an apron-shaped area of blue and white stripes on her now black dress. She tossed the apron and mob cap into a corner of the courtyard. You're lucky your clothes were navy blue, said Myrtle. She was right, Violet thought. The dirt didn't show as much. Score a point for Mother. Violet wondered if Mother was worried about her. Maybe she was just mad. It was an uncomfortable thought. Violet had never done anything as bad as running away before. Coming out of the alleys seemed to take less time than going in had. Soon they were on an ordinary street of ordinary brick houses. Two colored women sat on a set of stone steps, one of them rocking a baby carriage with her foot. Some boys played marbles. 
There were no heaps of garbage and no rats. They turned into another street, wide and clean-swept and lined with tall brick houses with bay windows. Model T's and some bigger, more expensive cars were parked along the street. There's a suffrage lady who lives here, Myrtle explained, leading Violet up a set of stone steps to a brick house. She rapped on the door with a brass knocker. The lady who opened the door was colored, with gray hair piled high on top of her head, and dressed in a blue brocaded dress with a high collar. There was something regal about her, Violet thought. She couldn't tell if it was the woman's bearing or her nose, which was long and had a royal tilt at the end. Probably both. The woman looked at Myrtle and Violet with a questioning eye. Myrtle seemed momentarily abashed, but recovered. Ma'am, are you Professor Mary Church Terrell? Yes, said the lady, and you are? Myrtle Davies, ma'am, said Myrtle, and this is Violet Mayhew, and we're looking for the woman suffrage ladies. Indeed, the, said Professor Terrell, raising an eyebrow at Violet. Which women suffrage ladies? My sister came here from New York to work, to work for women's suffrage, Violet said. I think she's working on the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Do you know? I am familiar with the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, yes, Professor Terrell said dryly. I think your sister is probably with Miss Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. Their headquarters is Cameron House on the west side of Lafayette Square near the White House. Do you know how to get there? Of course, ma'am, said Myrtle. Perhaps you'd better wash up a bit before you go, said Professor Terrell. Good day. I'm going to end there and I'll come right back to you.